studies have consistently shown, and we're starting to get more and more of this research, we're doing research in this area ourselves, that those who believe you know, conspiracy theories and the misinformation are more likely to get their, their facts from social media. So we're talking YouTube, we're talking Instagram, of course, we're talking you know, Facebook. And this was a study that came out uh, at McGill, uh, found you know, basically the same thing. People will get their news from Twitter and Facebook more likely to mis misinform as compared to, as compared to getting your information from those traditional news sources um, or, or from, from public health authorities. You know, you get it from the internet, you're more likely to misinform. No surprise, right? This was a study that found that Facebook was pr particularly problematic. It was kind of a cool study. They looked at over 7,000 bits, 7,000 bits of misinformation. And they found that over 4,000 of them had their origin on Facebook. Think about the, that the next time you see a bit of misinformation uh, on Facebook. Now, I, I study, in, uh, Martin noted this at the beginning, I'm very interested in celebrity culture uh, and the impact it can have on our lives. And yes, yes, celebrity culture is having an impact here. Celebrities are playing a big role. Um, you know, they are pushing the conspiracy theories, you know, crazy advice and wellness woo, as I call, as I call it, you know, ideas about supplements. Woody Harrelson has played a big role, I don't know if you guys knew this, in, in the 5G conspiracy theory, you know, pushing the idea that 5G technology, you know, which doesn't even make sort of scientific sense, it's not even scientifically plausible, but the idea that 5G technology um, is causing uh, COVID-19. COVID Look at this interesting study from Oxford. Uh, it really kind of highlights the role of prominent individuals um, in this discussion. So, so what this study found is that, you know, they looked at hundreds, hundreds of, of bits of, of, of things that have been confirmed as misinformation, that have been uh, fact-checked as mis misinformation that circulate in pop culture. And they found that about 20% of, of those informations had as their source a prominent individual, which is pretty high, actually, if you think about it, 20%. But look at the next line. 69% um, of what we share online is us sharing stuff from those prominent individuals. So that's really important, right? Because that, that highlights it's a top-down, bottom-up phenomenon. Um, that's useful because it also suggests what we need to do to fight the, mis the, the bunk, right? And I'll come back to that. So top, top down, hearing from prominent individuals and then us sharing it online. Look at this study. And this is a study that came out, um, it's still preprint by the way, uh, but, but from a good group at Cornell, uh, came out you know, really you know, just days ago, week, a week ago. Um, they found, they, they looked at over 38 million uh, bits of news in, uh, on both in traditional sources but online sources. They, they, they pared it down to, I think it was 1.1 million. So this is a big study, pretty robust. And look at this stat, you guys. 38% of those bits of misinformation involved Donald Trump. Yeah, so the headline, as, as it was in the New York Times, Donald Trump, the single biggest driver uh, of misinformation. In our own research, we're doing a study right now on hydroxychloroquine on, on Twitter. And, and, and yeah, we're finding the same kind of stuff. Amazing, right? Talk about prominent individuals, you know, shaping the public discourse. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight here uh, is the, the other major conclusion, which I don't think has got enough attention. They found that only 16% of those bits of misinformation were actually fact-checked, were actually corrected in any kind of way. Really depressing. So lots of misinformation out there, a lot of it coming from Donald Trump, uh, and not enough fact-checking. Check um, so I mean, first, really a personal thing real quick about start waking up every morning. Uh, I, I, always, I always try to start my day that way, by the way. I always think, because I, I love this area. I love, I love this field. I love my job. And so I always try to start my day with um, reading research. You know, this is even before COVID, right? Reading research and because um, I love it. And it's an easy to get out of bed to do that. Uh, I don't love this. <laughs> you know, like, uh, since COVID, I, I find it frustrating and exhausting, right? Because there's so much misinformation. So uh, it is, it can be a challenge to do this. And, and, and the reason I raise that, is I, I, it goes to the comment about mental health and, and stress. Um, there is, I think it's really important to give yourself a COVID break and a social media break. Um, and there are a lot of commentators, and this is one of the things I recommend when I speak more on specifically about stress and things. I, I do this myself. I try to give myself a COVID break, nine o'clock on, you know, no COVID. <laughs> And those who follow me on Twitter go, oh, you're a liar, you don't do that. <laughs> so I, I really do try to do that. I put my phone in my office and I walk away. 
So what are reliable sources? So um, despite, um, uh, I know that there are reasons to, to, to question entities like the CDC and the World Health Organization. And I do think we need to hold them accountable and, and to always ask them to be, to do, be the best they can be. Um, despite those controversies, I, I do think what we, you ask yourself, what is a responsible uh, source that is aggregating the information in a responsible manner? And I think that's really important, especially when the, the evidence and science is changing fast right here. And, and I still think the public health authorities, that, good place to go, the Public Health Authority, uh, Agency of Canada, your local, you know, I think provincial health authorities have by and large done a pretty good job um, in this really challenging time. World Health Organization has a good website that has that debunks myths about that I recommend that you go to, really easy to find if you just Google World Health Organization. And the other thing, Martin, I wanna say is, you know, we study misinformation in popular culture. Um, and we really thought that the general press, the, the traditional press was gonna screw this up. And yes, it hasn't been ideal. And I can point to places where they have screwed up where there's been false balance and things like that. But in general, uh, traditional news sources from our, our percentage, our viewpoint have been pretty good. And research tells us if you go to those traditional news sources, so, um, you know, the New York Times, the Globe and Mail, the CBC, um, you know, uh, National Post, not ideal all the time, but they've done a pretty good job. And I think early days they recognized, you know, right, you know, January, February, this is serious. And they've done a pretty good job. And I know I'm going on too long. I apologize. One more point I want to make. We did a study on, on the flu vaccine uh, and, and traditional print media. So it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, we started it before COVID. And our hypothesis was that traditional news media was screwing this up, right? And to our, so our hypothesis was wrong. We, our study found that we were wrong. And in fact, traditional news sources were doing a pretty good job representing the flu vaccine, you know, how eff efficacious it is, you know, the, the risks involved and how that people should get the flu vaccine and the benefits involved. So that tells us, that, you know, that's good news about that news source, but it also tells us, Martin, where the bad information is coming from. That's by and large, you know, Facebook, social media, and, and other sources. Great question. Uh, and, and this one's a really challenging one because science is biased. Right? Uh, we know that. Um, uh, we do research in this area ourselves. We do research on the impact of commercialization pressure on researchers, and we know that it can have an impact on both how the research is done and how it's represented. Uh, so I think, the answer is we need to be aware of that. And the other thing we have to do is we have to remind ourselves that science is not a list of facts. Science is not an institution. Uh, science is not an individual, it's not an industry. Science is a process. Uh, and science is a process that needs to be protected. So that's the, another reason that you always wanna to turn to the body of evidence and, and entities that are aggregating that evidence in a responsible manner. So there are entities that do that, right? When you do, those meta, do that meta-analysis and systematic reviews, when you do them responsibly, you try to account for that, bi that bias um, when you do the analysis. Um, so that's really important to, to recognize that because you still you want to look at the aggregate of, of the information that's out there. And by the way, this is one of the things that we want to highlight in our report for the Royal Society of Canada. We are going to note that this is, is, is an, an, important, uh, an important thing to consider. So my life, it's been drastic. It has been drastic. Martin, you know this and, and are part of the reason for my usual travel plans. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, so I used to travel a couple times a week, yeah. um, you know, 200,000 miles a year. I, I haven't traveled uh, or left my house almost since March. Um, so I haven't been to my office since March. Um, my wife is a physician. Um, as I said, my, my, one of my brothers is a, um, as a nurse. So we follow the protocols very, very carefully. Um, we try to physical distance. My, my in-laws, um, who I love dearly, uh, some of my best friends live blocks away. And so we do physical distancing um, uh, visiting um, when we see them. And they're, they're, you know, they're seniors. Um, so we, we have embraced all of those classic things. We physical distance, we wear masks when we go out. I haven't gone back to my office at the University of Alberta. Um, and we try to be responsible um, when we think about uh, when we think about uh, um, not only symptoms ourselves but people in our, our circle that have symptoms. Um, so it's challenging. I, I will say this: I have four kids, 
uh, and they go to school all over, all over the world. And it's really, you know, one of my kids goes to Notre Dame, which has been kind of not notorious. <laughs> you, know, the, um, you know, the president of Notre Dame has, has tested positive. And it's fascinating to see the different approaches. But I think regardless of where you are, the basics are the same. Wash your hands, wear a mask, physical distance, take care of yourself, take care of yourself, take care of your family, and we'll get through this.